commandments. That's the lesson we'll be on today, keeping the commandments. If you don't have, have the lesson with you, there's some spares up here. If you would, take your Bible and turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. The Lord has blessed us with knowledge. We're going to expand our horizons and our knowledge more today. A lot of people look in generalities when they look at the Bible. But we're going to expand our horizons a little bit, refine our learning. Uh, refresh your memory some of what we're going to study today we have studied before that's the good part about God's word it all ties together it does not contradict itself so uh, this is 1 John chapter 2 1 John chapter 2 verse 3 let's read that and then we'll start our lesson and hereby now the word hereby means in this. And in this we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now one thing from the very start of this lesson I want to uh, bring your attention to is uh, look at the, see there in verse 3 that last word commandment. What's the letter on the end? It's an S. What does that mean? Huh? Plural. What does plural mean? There's more than one. Okay. Now I know all you old folks have forgotten all that, so I'm going to... What are you grinning about, Truman? Until I said it's studied God's Word, I didn't even know it. Much less forgot it. Praise God that He give us this knowledge here. Now look at there at the end of the verse. If we keep His commandments, and that's plural got S on the end of it. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, plural, is a liar, and the truth's not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, now I've drawn a line between commandment in verse 4 and word in verse 5 from a prior study. That tells me those two are about the same. But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. That means realized. Hereby we know that we, we that are in him, he that saith he abideth, that means to stay in place, in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment. See, there ain't no S on the end of that one. It means that's singular unto you. But an old commandment, singular which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which things is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Now let's come back to our Sunday school lesson. Knowing what we just, just read is true, then we're, go we're going to stay pretty close to the lesson here today. Uh, there at the first part of page one, keeping the commandments. Most of the religious world believes that being saved is a result of one's personal goodness. Most who call themselves Christians believe you are saved only if you keep the commandments of the Bible. Very few are certain of just what they mean by keeping the commandments. Now, I've experienced that in my lifetime. They say you need to keep the commandments. Okay, what? What, uh, what are the commandments? Well, they can't tell you. Keep reading. Some things, some think, some people think that you must keep the Ten Commandments. I truly hope nobody in this room thinks that Ten Commandments are all they are to it. They're not. If they are, if that's what you're thinking, you need to go back to Leviticus and Deuteronomy and a, a bunch of these up here in the front and do some reading. Because that's not, that's just, the Ten Commandments, there's a bunch more. 
None of them are sure. Uh, some people think that to be saved, you must keep a large percentage of the commandments. Well, you ask them, and, and I see Brother Lester here must have run across that too, because you ask them what percentage is that, and they can't tell you. They don't know what percentage it is. A, a few people think you cannot be saved unless you keep all the commandments. I don't know how. Is there anybody in here that's kept half the commandments? I don't know of anybody that could say I kept all the commandments. How are you going to do that? First of all, I don't know of anybody that knows what all the commandments are. I know people that's been studying the Word of God for 40 years, and they still learn things. I'd venture to say, Brother Earl, how long have you been preaching? 40 years? Brother Earl, how long have you been preaching? 40 years? You know all there is to know about the commandments? I don't know anybody that does. That's the marvelous part about it. You keep learning. In uh, there in 1 John 2, 3 through 8, it that deals with this subject. Verse 3 says, we know him if we keep his commandments. There in verse 3. We read that in your hearing. Verse 5 says, we know that we are in him if we keep his word. It becomes evident by comparing these two verses that keeping his commandments and keeping his, his word, and I told you how I drew a line across there, I refer to one thing. If knowing him and being in him, to, verse 5, depend upon keeping all his commandments and all his word, then there's no one who knows him or, is, or who is in him, for no one knows all of his words or keeps all of his commandments. Now, he throws some scriptures in here, and they are very pertinent, and I will read them to you. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Whatever the word or commandment refers to in this text are, they must be kept. Failure to keep them means a person is lost and without a savior. Therefore, every earnest person should should want to know what the word or commandments are which must be kept in order to have eternal life. It is true that there is a word or commandments which must be kept for one to have salvation. And we're going to study that. But we maintain that the word or commandments are specific. No one, and I underline that word right there in our lesson, no one is required to know the entire word of God and keep all of the commandments found therein in order to be saved. If that was a prerequisite, brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't know of any of us that'd be saved. To know the entire word of God and to know all the commandments and to keep them. If that was a, if that was a prerequisite for salvation, I'm afraid we'd all be in a bind. But praise God, he set it up with a better system. Now, Right here at Roman numeral one, it says it's easy to jump to conclusions when reading or studying God's word. That comes back to rightly dividing the word of God. And that's what we're fixing to do. Rightly divide the word of God. Don't see right here at there, paragraph one it says, Don't assume too much. We need to rightly divide the word of God when we study God's word. Uh, and he gives an example here. Several ladies mentioned in the Bible were named Mary. It'd be foolish to assume that every Bible use of the name Mary is automatically Mary, the mother of Jesus. It'd be absolutely foolish to assume that all Bible references to Mary speak of that same person. Sanity demands knowing which Mary, which Mary. Okay, as this is true, we need to know which Mary. We've also learned in our prior lessons that it, when the Bible refers to saved, we need to know which tense it is. And I think I'm bringing it more and more to your attention. What did we say? Save from the penalty of sin. Save from the power of sin. Save from the presence of sin. We are rightly dividing the word of God. And when we say Mary in the Bible, it isn't automatically the mother of Jesus. So you don't need to jump to conclusions or, or assume too much. Things that appear to be the same are not necessarily the same. 
that statement should jump out at you. Things that appear to be the same are not necessarily the, st the same. An understanding of the fact is particularly important in considering the subject of keeping the commandments, rightly dividing the word of God. Now turn the page over to page, page two of this. The word and commandments which one must keep in order to have salvation are limited to the gospel and the love that automatically accompanies belief of the gospel. Not every scriptural use of terms such as the truth, the word, the commandments are references to the whole Bible and all the truth. Now I know this for a fact as, as, uh, as Brother Lester brought this out. A lot of people when you refer to uh, the word they in their minds and, and maybe in your mind when, if I come up and said have you been reading the word you would think of this as a whole wouldn't you as a whole okay we need to be more specific in our learning because the word here isn't necessarily the whole thing for example in there in item two the Pharisees and you know who the Pharisees are because we studied them. The scribes and the Pharisees, they're the ones that got together and killed Jesus. You know who the Pharisees are. They're a religious bunch. The Pharisees kept many commandments of the scriptures. That was what they hung their hat on. The commandments of the scriptures. Old Mosaic law. Uh, there you can see the, the references. They kept the commandments for praying and that's that's in Matthew of giving alms. Y'all know what giving alms is? You know what giving alms is? Huh? If you don't know, that's okay. Giving alms. Okay, is that is that the equivalent of tithes? Good. Y'all did learn something. <laughs> If you don't know what alms are, look it up. It's fun. Giving alms, that's Matthew. Tithing, that's different. In spite of the fact that they kept many Bible commandments, look what Jesus said to them. My word hath no place in you. Now, they were keeping a bunch of these commandments. And Jesus told them, my word has no place in you. He said in the same group, Jesus said in the same group, because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Now he's talking to a really religious gr uh, group here, the Pharisees. They never did accept Jesus Christ. They didn't accept him then. Again, it's clear that all the truths of the Bible were not under consideration, but a specific aspect of the truth. In 1 Peter 1, it illustrates the fact that the truth... The word in similar terms are not always references to the whole scripture. Peter spoke of believers as being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. At the time a person believes in Christ, he doesn't know the entire Bible. And we could, we could stay there for a while. If... You had to know the entire Bible to be saved. Would anybody in here be saved? No. When I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I didn't know. I didn't know what none of this was. I knew I I needed a Savior. I knew that my sin sick soul was headed to hell. The gospel of death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was presented to me in a way that I could understand and a light come on I need a savior and I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior I didn't know I didn't know the whole Bible did you know the whole Bible no how could you at a time a person believes in Christ he doesn't know the whole Bible it's obvious that he doesn't know have to know all there is to know of God's word in order to be saved what he does have to know is the part of the word which is defined to be the gospel. Now, do y'all know what the gospel is? You ought to know. 1 Corinthians 15, 
The gospel, yeah, and it's right there in your book. The gospel is the fact that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it so simple? Isn't it a fabulous thing that God made that so simple? When you compare 1 Corinthians 15 to 1 Peter 1, it's clear that the word of God under consideration is the gospel, not the whole of the scriptures. The truth that is mentioned in 1 Peter 1 is a reference to the gospel, not all the truths. This is the truth which their refuse to believe left the Pharisees lost. They rejected that truth. If they had have accepted that truth, Jesus might still be alive. It was the word that had no place in them. The word and truth in these references are identical and correspond to the truth in the word which are mentioned. Only by belief of this word or truth can they become the children of God. The word of God is the instrument of revelation whereby a lost sinner perceives his condition and the remedy of it. Go down there to uh, C, paragraph 1. The commandments mentioned in 1 John that we read here, chapter 2, deal with man's responsibility towards the revealed word of God. The combined significance of the word and the commandment is the belief of the truth. It is the belief of the gospel, the belief, the believing of the divine report. None of them refer to all the truths of Scripture, but refer to the word of truth. It is through this gospel message that sinners are begotten into God's fam family. Look at 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15. For in Christ Jesus have I begotten you through the gospel. This knowledge. Belief, believe, receive, a bunch of these terms correspond to the commandments, plural. Lost sinners are commanded to believe or receive the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. This is God's command. One must keep that commandment. There's no other way to be saved. One command. You notice right here it's, plural, it's singular right there. One must keep that. The scriptures do not teach that one must know all the word of God. Paragraph 5 in our page 3. Keep all of the commandments or the, of the entire, you don't have to know all the word or keep all the commandments of the entire Bible in order to be saved. Praise God. <coughs> the passage is teaching that in order to be saved, a person must hear that portion of the word related to the lost the part that's related to the lost and obey the command to believe it. Why do you think this church preaches and teaches the gospel so profoundly? And we need to learn other things, but to bring lost sinners to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, we must preach and teach the gospel. That's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why... Brother Earl brings these gospel messages. Keep pounding on it. It's like chipping away at a big hard rock. Now, we, we saw here, and I brought it to your attention about the commandments and the commandment, singular and plural. Two commands related to eternal life are mentioned. One is belief of the gospel, and the other is love. And brothers and sisters, there's a sequence there. And these things are separated out even though they're the same because there is a sequence. You say, how can there be a sequence? There is a sequence. Just bear me out. You see there in 1 John chapter 2, look at verse 7. Verse 7, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. The old commandment, and he, he specifically states what it is. There, uh, Roman numeral 2, item A, paragraph 2. The old commandment. 
this old commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. John said we had this commandment from the beginning. You remember, that's what Paul, that's what Moses, that's what all these people were preaching and teaching. And here's a whole list of scriptures. Mark 1, 1 speaks of the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In the beginning of his preaching, which dated from the baptism of John, Jesus was affirmed to be Christ our Savior. That was something that the Pharisees rejected. All these scriptures were designed to enable men to see that the old commandment, which Jesus preached from the beginning, was that men believe the gospel. They believe the truth. That's a commandment. Jesus affirmed from the beginning of his ministry that he was the Messiah and that salvation could only come through him. He declared that message to his hearers from the beginning. Jesus did not come with some new message of salvation and some new means of appropriating it. Paul declared himself to be a witness of those things which the prophets and Moses did say shall come, that Christ shall suffer and in he he should be the first to rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and unto the Gentiles. Now, that's recorded in Acts 26. But you notice it has reference here which the prophets and Moses did say. This is from the beginning. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Anyone who thinks that the command of sinners is not an age-old command doesn't know much about the scriptures. Look you up here at Luke chapter 24. Jesus rose. Paul said that message is set forth in Moses and the prophets. After Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared unto two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus and said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Jesus said this. All that the prophets have spoken. This makes it back from the beginning, this message, the old commandment, there in item 4, 1 John 2, 7. 1 John 2, 7, read it. I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which he had from the beginning. Which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is not difficult to distinguish. God's commandment to the lost has always been for them to believe the gospel. That's why it's so important that we know what the gospel is. Now, we have studied this before this new commandment. 1 John chapter 2, verse 8. We've studied this before, brothers and sisters, but I bring it back to your attention. Look at verse 8. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which things is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. A new commandment I write unto you. Now, once I get into this, you're going to say, hey, I've heard that before because we have studied this before. Looky here. As in the case of the old commandment, the scripture leaves no doubt what the new commandment is. Jesus gave it. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another. And then he ups the ante. You remember me saying that? God wants us to love each other, and then he up the ante. What does it say there in John 13? As I have loved you. That puts a whole new light on it. What does love mean, brothers and sisters? That means we overlook each other's shortcomings. Love each other as I loved you. Man, that ups the ante a whole bunch there. That's the new commandment, that ye also love one another. Jesus was clearly speaking to believers, those who were his followers. This commandment is to the children of God, to save people, not lost people. How can lost people know what the love of God is if they don't even know who God is? So you see, there is a sequence there. We cannot have the love of God in us until we're saved. It is at the point of our salvation that the Holy Spirit of God indwells in believers. You see how important it was when Jesus was fixing to be crucified? He said, it, it is advantageous to your cause 
that I die. Because if I'm still alive, I can only be in one place. But if I die, the Holy Spirit resides within each and every one of you. You see what a sacrifice Jesus made for us? Now the Holy Spirit dwells within us. We have a, a Messiah, a Holy Spirit, and His love should dwell. Now, as it's mentioned right here at the very bottom, item B, paragraph 3, this is something that, that we know. All say people have the love of God in us. They don't always manifest it well. We don't always love each other the way we ought to love each other. Because the Bible says the new commandment, love each other as I have loved you. It's there, brothers and sisters. But it's not always manifested well. Anybody guilty of that? Guilty of that? Not loving each other? Not overlooking each other's shortcomings? Not saying, hey, brother, you forgot your devotion. I'll step in. I'll do it for you. Now, that didn't happen today. Because <laughs> the first Sunday is mine, isn't it? Yeah. You forgot, you forgot to do this, and I'll step in for you. I, I love you, brother. I'm going to... I forgot to do something and you stepped in for me. Praise God, people love me. Thank you. The love of God is always there. You see there in item three, love is an outward testimony of one's obedience to God's command. It's an outward show of your obedience to God's command to believe the gospel. Love is an outward tangible thing that the world can see because of the inward change within your mind. Now, what did we say repentance was? You see how all that ties together? What's repentance? It's a change. You change your mind about stuff, didn't you? Yeah, I decided maybe going to Silver River on Sunday, Saturday night and sleeping in Sunday morning, that ain't what I need to do. I need to be in the house of God singing praises to Him. A change of mind. See how all this ties together? Isn't that wonderful? An outward testimony of one's obedience to God's command to believe the gospel. It testifies that your love testifies that you are saved. But it's not always manifested well in us. Once a person believes, love is automatically shed abroad in him. Look here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. And this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. The two commandments became, become inseparable. You cannot be, truly believe without having a love for your fellow brethren. That's the point I'm going to really drive home. You can't truly believe in Jesus Christ without having a love for your brethren. Evidence of that love may vary, but the love itself will always be there. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten. First John. Now, let's go to the last page and then we'll quit. This was a short lesson, but a powerful one. God's love. At their spiritual birth, he gives his children of his love. By touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye Ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Love comes at belief and is a visible manifestation of that belief. The commandment to believe and to love are separate and are called commandments here in 1 John chapter 2 for the purpose of distinguishing the order of their occurrence. That's important. You can't manifest God's love if you don't know God. If you don't know who he is. If you don't acknowledge him as your heavenly father. How are you going to love as he loved others? So you see there is a sequencing issue here. There is an order of occurrence. Now in conclusion we conclude that God's word does not teach that men are saved by keeping all the commandments of the Bible as some people propagate. 
we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That's always true. No one is saved by good deeds or by keeping one or many behavioral commandments. Salvation for sin's penalty is still the result of a sinner's obedience to God's one command, to believe the gospel. Let's have a closing word of prayer, and then we'll take a short break.